speak on celebration and celebrating life. If you picked up the Bible for the first time and read the gospel for today, you will either close it with a haste or in a haste or consider the text crazy. Who wants the head of someone for dessert? Who? Is the question you would ask yourself. But let me encourage you that the, disgusting as this may sound, this account may sound, a brighter picture is seen as we read to the end of the chapter and encounter the feeding of the multitude by Jesus. What seemed to be so dark, obscure, and possibly frightening is bordered by God's desire in feeding those who are hungry. And when we look at the gospel for today, we see some kind of relevance in providing for those in need at the banquet. But Jesus' banquet was free and open to all. But why do we celebrate? As I said, I'm talking on celebrating this morning. And you wonder how I got that, but you will see it in a moment. Why do we celebrate and when do we celebrate? Any celebration, big or small, is really about taking a bit of notice, the good stuff in our lives. It can also be a reminder of our talents and abilities, skills and persistence. Drawing on those things can motivate us to keep working towards our goals, even when we are not yet there. These moments of celebration make us pause and be mindful, and that boosts our well-being. According to social psychology researcher Fred Bryant and others, they say when we stop to save all, the good stuff, we buffer ourselves against the bad and build resilience. And even mini celebrations can plump up the positive emotions, which make it easier to manage the daily challenges that cause major stress. In our world in which we we'll live, when there is not that time for us to relax and to concentrate and focus on what God has done, when life hinges upon just the realities of the everydayness of life, stress becomes overwhelming. The problem in our world today is that many of us want to deal with the world's problem without God. And without God, life is useless. From the readings, we see primarily two kings who had a reason for celebrating or celebration. From the Old Testament, we see David, a man after God's own heart, celebrating the return of the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. And in the Gospel, we see Herod celebrating his birthday. Two kings, two celebrations, two outcomes, two sense of direction. From the Old Testament, we know that the Ark was vital to worship in Israel. It was symbolic of God's presence among his people. It was often carried into battle in front of the soldiers. Once the ark was there, God was there. Just like you and I, we do not see God, but wherever we are, God is within us. God is with us through difficult times, through good times, through successes, through failures. But that comes through a conscious recognition and appreciation of God's promises to us. This act was central to the children of Israel's lives, their, relation, their worship and their relationship with God. But the ark had not been kept in the central position that it deserved. And as a result, neither had God been in their community. Way back in the days of Eli, some 75 years earlier, the ark had been taken by the Philistines. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 11. However, God punished the Philistines 
all the time the ark was in their possession. You cannot possess what you don't possess. When you possess your possession, you are followed with blessings. But for the Philistines, the ark did not belong to them. And therefore they suffered, according to 1 Samuel chapter 5 and chapter 6. Their solution was to place the ark on a new cart and allow the cattle that pulled the ark take the box back to Israel in voluntary, just load it. Although we read in the accounts the leadership of those whose responsibility it was. So after 75 years, David is about to take Israel and lead them to go after God with great celebration and dancing. We do not have the ark like Israel, but we still need the presence of God just as much as they did. We need in us and we need the power and his manifest presence in our lives and in our worship. How discouraging it is when we worship and do not experience the presence of God. Rather we rely on feelings rather than knowing that God is with us and worship is towards God. This Old Testament passage has something to offer us in the 21st century of what happens to us when God is in our midst, we celebrate with dancing. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty and freedom. For David, the God of Israel was above everything else. Nothing was above God. Where is God in our own lives? He forgot about his position, his affluence, his power, and focused on the presence of God. He danced so much at Michal. Seeing him with just a tunic, he was possibly half naked and dancing before the ark with all he got. Please note that when our positions become more important than the God we serve, we are in serious problem. When we cannot lift our hand to God in praise because of who we are and the titles we have, we are in deep problem. When we realize that our position and affluence denies us to recognize the presence of God in our lives. We are in deep problem. When God walks a miracle and instead of attesting to it as God's power, we are claiming to scientific discoveries and God is left out of the picture, we've missed it. David danced before the Lord, position or not, because the presence of God was once again coming into Israel and nothing could stop him. When God takes entrance into our lives, nothing can stop us from rejoicing. Amen? Amen? Because when God comes to us, the power of God is made manifest. And nothing, nothing, nothing can stop us. When we get to the gospel, the passage we find another king, King Herod, celebrating his birthday. I don't think there was anything wrong with celebrate or there is anything wrong with celebrating birthdays. We only have to be careful for a number of reasons. Herod was celebrating his birthday. A chosen community has been invited. He looks higher than all of them. He's higher placed than all of them, but fails to recognize the power and the majesty of God who had placed him in such a position. Herod was king, but he was a very corrupt king. Herod had taken his brother's wife for himself, and John had spoken openly against it. You cannot do it. As a result, John was arrested and imprisoned, and for the sake of just fear, kept alive. When we see the courage, we see John's devotion, certain things come to mind. There is the evidence of both power and prophetic ministry. We see that prophets don't always make headlines, although these days we have the counterfeit of whatever Hollywood is doing, of recognizing some of our religious gurus. But prophets, there are no ticket tape parades for prophets. No Academy Awards, although they have one now for prophets. 
or lavish receptions for prophets. Yet prophets have an undeniably authenticity to speak truth to power and give hope to the powerless. When the prophet of God or when the church becomes the prophet of voice of God and speaks to the truth, great power is released and those that are powerless are empowered. But when the church ceases to be the prophetic voice of God in a world that is dominated by injustice and otherwise, and seek for the political acceptance and political correctness, we lose our prophetic call and we become saltless, like salt that is not good for anything. <coughs> in this, we are both drawn to and driven from the good news of prophetic ministry. We sometimes do the things that Herod did. We will cut off the prophet's head, rather than his saying that the prophet has changed our hearts or that the prophet is not living according, or the king is not living according to God's standards. I believe that was why Nicodemus, the leader of the Pharisees, came to Jesus by night. And I believe that's why the demon-possessed man stood up in church asking Jesus, what do you want with me, Jesus of Nazareth? I believe that's why Nicodemus climbed the sycamore tree. There is something about prophetic voice that calls us to our better selves, that disturbs what the world calls normal or good. We make the world uncomfortable with a prophetic word from God that sets people free. John was bold enough to speak against King Herod because he recognized the authority of the King of Kings. And when we know the King of Kings, there is nothing we are afraid of because we must not be afraid of those who will only kill the body, but we must be afraid of those who will kill both body and soul and send us to eternal punishment. In the 21st century, God is listening for voices that will speak against the injustices, the separation of children from their parents, the misguided principles that are governing immigration and other things and come to the point of resolving those differences so that all will be equal under the law. But here are a few points for you to take home from this. Whenever we celebrate, we must celebrate for the right reason. Amen? When we celebrate to show our power, our authority and everything, watch it. Danger is not too far. Herod had, respected, had respect for John, but never made commitment to the message he preached, the message of repentance. He adhered to him, he listened to him, he's excited by him. And there are many leaders in our world today who know the truths about God, but fail to make commitments to it, and sometimes we are invited to their banquets. And to impress us, they will make commitments. Number three, Keep God in focus, not individual achievements and positions, because they distract us from recognizing the presence of God wherever we are. Lastly, watch what promises you make to those near you and those away from you that you have invited, because sometimes your very mouth betrays you, and sometimes you find yourself without any backbone or without strength to support it. Herod, I believe, thought the girl would ask for material things. But being innocent and not knowing what to do, it goes to the mother. I don't want to speak about the mother this morning. But you know when, uh, uh, let, let, let me say this, not because I am possibly a, a, a chauvinist, but you give, a, whatever you give a woman, she gives you a double portion of it. You know that? They know how to incubate, nurture, deliver. And I think the wife was so angry with John the Baptist that all he wanted, she wanted, is to kill him. And here the king makes the biggest mistake in his life and asks the girl to ask for anything. We need to note that an obsession with power, prestige, 
and reputation provide motive again and again for evils that will otherwise not be committed when we want to prove who we are. Herod did not want the beheading of John the Baptist, did not want the prophet's severed head put on a platter for the dessert and given to his daughter. Herodias, he did not want a banquet of dance recital to end in brutality and blood, but he had given his word for the sake of his host and for his guests, Herod ordered the death of a man whom he knew to be just and holy. Thus it has been and thus it will be until all powers are subject to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, they will be deprived of real value and real power. Notwithstanding the evils of the present age, the victory of Christ the King, the King of Peace, is assured and promised. Jesus is writing in Scripture or written about in Scripture, and all around us the beauty of creation speaks volume to us of a God who is always with us. Let those who have eyes to see, see. Jesus is the ark of God. The empty space between the cherubim, the empty space between the burial garments, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2, and John 20, verse 6 and 7. Jesus is nothing and yet the source of everything. Jesus is the light of the world, the light of humanity, the source, guide, and goal of all that is. Let those of a brave and joyful heart take up the ark and bring it to the center of the city, to the center of our worship, into the heart of the earth. And let those who hear the music dance like they've never danced before, dance with the victory of love, dance with the inspiration that God is in control, that God wins every victory for us. Jesus is King who invites and inspires as to the dance of life and how wonderful that dance is. Jesus is, is everything and yet he deigns to be here. Where we are, God is. Jesus is. God the Father is always with us. Chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in his love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestows on us in his beloved. Just as Jesus is the tabernacle of God, we are temples of God's Holy Spirit. God lives within us now. We carry him everywhere. He does not live in an ark or in a box. God lives in us and the power of the Holy Spirit. The ark we welcome, we become by deep mystical communion of our connectedness with God. The good pleasure of the Father, the lavish grace of the Father poured into the Son, sips into the daughters and sons of God of which you and I are. We are the good pleasure of God set forth in Christ and yet the less we are the less we maneuver and compete like the rulers of this age the less the ego has to claim and defend the more new humanity in Christ emerges for, for to me to live is Christ to die is gain. then we could say with gospel and with strength it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live, I live through the grace of God and through the power of God's Spirit. Strangely, this new dispossessed self is deeper. When we empty ourselves, we become deeper in God. We become stronger and we become more stable and the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. In Christ, we have redemption by His blood and the forgiveness of our sins. But we also have something more. We have the sheer and unbridled joy of being alive from the dead. What are we to do? When David and his house brought the ark 
of God from Baal Jodah. There was dancing with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. There was shouting and the sound of trumpet, leaping and dancing. There is benediction in the sharing of the bread and the meat and the cake and risen when God comes to us or when God is manifest to us. Life is full and our joy is complete. We have a choice of the God who is with us. Either to dance like David or to use our position in fear instead of representing that which is true. We kill the one who speaks the truth. This week you and I will come in situations whereby we will be faced with challenges. How would we represent God? Would we demonstrate that God is with us and be confident with Him? That even if it's death, we are willing to die for the sake of the gospel. I think in this 21st century, God is looking for prophets in all of you, all of us, that will speak God's truth. Especially as we see the political slants and other things that seem to be swaying from one end to the other without direction. I pray that God will raise in America prophets and kings who will speak to the truth irrespective of the consequences. For whether we speak or not, if we speak or not, God will raise up someone who will speak. But who will that one be? I pray it will be you or me or those who name the name of Christ. But in all things, remember, God is always with you. God is always with you. God never leaves us alone. God always wants the best for us. The only way we can be instruments of God's best is to listen to Him and to walk with Him every step of the way. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, he danced. Irrespective of his position, he knew he was dancing to honor the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So dance, dance, dance and celebrate. Amen. Amen.